Okay, so now cultural relativism. Three, cultural relativism. Because postmodern theory believes truth and knowledge are constructed by the dominant discourses within a society, and because we can't examine our own system and categories from the outside, it insists that no one set of cultural norms is any better than another. Any critique made by someone outside of a culture will be incorrect at best and immoral at worst, since it presupposes your culture to be objectively superior. For example, a wealthy person's critique of society will always be seen as being colored by their privilege. It will be potentially dismissed because it will be assumed to be ignorant of the realities of oppression, or just an attempt to serve the critic's own interests. The postmodern belief that individuals enact discourses of power depending on where they stand in relation to power means that cultural critique can only be effectively wielded by the marginalized or oppressed. Okay, so cultural relativism, I feel like this is something that we have seen kind of weave in and out both of the power and knowledge principle because of the implications of it. If you start saying that no one way of being or no one truth or no one way of determining truth is any better than any other, then it removes your impetus to change from one to the other. But then it adds that dimension of oppression as if some culture or society has set up boundaries, rules, punishments based on stepping outside of some form of norm or some socially constructed norm, then that now is a form of danger or oppression that you can act on to try to normalize, destigmatize. And that's where we start to see some moral dimension be added into the implications of this philosophy. Because if you see social norms, as arbitrary and constructed and the enforcement of extremes by government as oppressive, then you want to try to undo that by getting rid of those norms and expanding the ways that people can be, the potentialities of being. Because if all morals are relative and culturally constructed, the logic goes, who's to say what's wrong and what's right? Who's to say? This was famously lampooned in a series of Saturday Night Live sketches. What is abnormal sexual behavior? Who decides, you know? Uh, who gets to determine, you know, what's okay, you know? And then what's weird? Take this fella right here. What if, uh, you know, he has somebody, uh, you know, pee into a cardboard birthday hat, right? Uh, then he has them, you know, pour that right down his back, collect that, in his second birthday hat, this fella climaxes because of that. Is that weird? Is that abnormal? Who's to say? Day three is devoted to fantasy role play scenarios, including sexy hospital, sexy insurance scam, and sexy robbery. So on the floor, lady. Oh, great. Well, do whatever you want with me. Just don't shoot my brains out. See, now what's she gonna do? She starts thinking of stuff. What, what, what are you gonna do? We could polish that apple between our butt cheeks. Without letting it hit the floor? Yeah, I don't know, is that kinky or is that weird? You tell me, is it? Who's to say? Exactly. <gasps> Who's to say? And so you might see this in some realms where men can have ponytails. If the social norm is that men are clean cut, it's like the 1950s, well then you can break those norms by having a bunch of hippies with long hair and that's okay. And you drill down on that. And then you can, the people who are like against that become the oppressors and the people who aren't. So that's like a, a banal, way of seeing this fine expression in society. So you get, you have something minor like the hair length of a hippie, but then you can have something extreme. There's this moment in the debate between Foucault and Chomsky where they're talking about whether or not the revolution of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie was just. And Chomsky makes the assertion that if the proletariat overthrowing the bourgeoisie would lead in murder and violence of the bourgeoisie, then they, he wouldn't want that to happen, that it would be an unjust revolution. And Foucault responds in a way that is, it's both honest about his philosophy, but it's also a little bit chilling about the lengths to which people who adopt it are willing to go. Let's see here. So this starts around... Okay, the conversation starts with Chomsky saying that the proletariat would want to rev have their revolution because they believed that they had justice on their side and that it was a form of justice to overthrow their oppressors. And Foucault pushes back on that. 
So those two guys, I had to learn everything about them in grad school. You sign up for Spanish literature and those two guys are who you get. In France, there is currently a debate about the problem of justice and that of popular judicial institution. A certain number of people, including Sartre, believe that in order to make a critique of the current penal system or of police practices, we have to create a kind of tribunal which, in the name of a superior, ideal, and human justice, will condemn the practices of the French judges or policemen. Moreover, there is another group of people, myself included, who say this shouldn't be done because, when they refer to an ideal justice, which the tribunal is supposed to apply, they refer to a certain number of judicial ideas which were formed in our time by a certain number of individuals who are themselves, directly or indirectly, a product of their societies. So you can see him there arguing from his perspective correctly that if you use a notion of some higher ideal justice as the reason for overturning the institutions of society as they currently exist, then that's false because you're simply replicating some other socially constructed thing. That's not a good justification. And so he disagrees with the people that say that is what we need to do, have a tribunal to apply some higher notion of justice. And so you then you would say, what would then be your reason? And that's where this debate seems to be going. We have to attack the practices of justice. We have to attack the police and their practices but in terms of war and not in terms of justice. That your role in the war is a just role, that you're fighting a just war to bring in a concept from another domain. And that, I think, has to, is important. If you thought that you were fighting an unjust war, you couldn't follow that line of reasoning. And the only, see, I would like to slightly reformulate what you said. It doesn't seem to me that the difference is between legality and ideal justice it's rather between legality and better justice. Now, this better system may have its defects, certainly will, but comparing the better system with the existing system uh, and not being confused into thinking that our better system is the ideal system, we can then argue, I think, as follows, that the concept of legality and the concept of justice are not identical. They're not entirely distinct either, insofar as legality incorporates justice in this notion, in this sense of better justice, referring to a better society, then we're just, then we should follow and obey the law and force the state to obey the law and force the great corporations to obey the law and force the police to obey the law. If we have the power to do so, of course, so, so, not, if, but not in so, just so, so final, if in those areas where the legal system happens to represent not better justice, but rather the techniques of oppression that have been codified in a particular autocratic system, then a reasonable human being should disregard and oppose them, at least in principle. He may not, for some reason, do it in fact. I would simply like to reply to your first sentence. When you said that if you didn't consider the war you wage against the police to be just, you wouldn't wage it. I would like to reply to you in terms of Spinoza and tell you that the proletariat doesn't wage war against the ruling class because it considers such a war to be just. The proletariat wages war against the ruling class because it wants, for the first time in history, to take power. And because of its will to overthrow power, it considers such a war to be just. One wages war to win, not because it's just. I think it's so funny that they say the postmodernists aren't Marxists, but then they just view the world as proletariat versus bourgeoisie. But he's not a Marxist. Yeah, I know. He, that was, his answer was insane to me. Is he saying that they don't view the war against police as just, they view the war as a means to get power and therefore it is just. So he, it's like he answered and then unanswered. Hence, we want power. It is just, but is he just saying they don't start from the assumption that in order to engage in warfare, it has to be just, but that engaging in warfare is just, I, I don't know, I'm getting lost. In my it's head. the Nietzschean will to power itself is just, and it doesn't matter that you justify it in these other ways that Chomsky might be wanting to 
No, nah, it makes sense. It's just that it's time for you to be in power. So you go take the power and that's what's just about it. But it also saves his theory that it's all relative and the proletariat's relative power isn't any better than the bourgeoisie's relative power. It's just, they're going to be the power now because it, it's like, it's pure conflict theory. Like no longer does it have to be that there's a higher notion of justice that you're shaping society around. It's just that society is based on the oppressed and the oppressors and the class that is currently not in power is justified in taking power just by nature of it currently not being in power. And the acquisition and taking of that power is the only justification that you need. And I suspect that the word just as he uses it there is more for justification than justice. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Once the proletariat comes into power, are they really even considered proletariat anymore? Yeah, now they're the bourgeoisie and it's justified for the other side to fight for it back. But even under his same theories, if it's all just power, there's nothing wrong with the bourgeoisie saying they're just going to power and use their power and, and maintain power. I think there's a sense that there's something intrinsic to the working class. And this utopian idealism seems to pop up anywhere there's a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, socialist revolution. That is the real clencher though in this debate. The first point to make is that when he's talking about moral relativism, nothing's better that he believes that, but it leaves him with power as the main justification. And the lens through which he looks at the world defined by Marxist conflict theory as expressed through Maoism and whatever way that he has is the justification here. But how far that goes now comes here. And I love, like Chomsky's brilliant at times where he really responds to these things. And I believe later he's like, I realized in the middle of this debate that there's a completely different moral landscape that Foucault and I operate from. And this is coming out at these moments in this debate. Okay, let's see. I think I get one wages war to win, not because it's just. I don't personally agree with that. For example, if I could convince myself that attainment of power by the proletariat would lead to a terroristic police state in which freedom and dignity and decent human relations would be destroyed. Then Spoiler, it does. I wouldn't want the proletariat to take power. In fact, the only reason for wanting any such thing, I believe, is because one thinks, rightly or wrongly, that some fundamental human values will be achieved by that transfer of power. I don't, je voulais... When the proletariat takes power, it may be quite possible that the proletariat will exert towards the classes over which it has just triumphed a violent, dictatorial, and even bloody power. Violent, dictatorial, et même sanglant. Je ne vois pas quelle objection. I can't see what objection one could make to this. But if you ask me what would be the case if the proletariat exerted bloody, tyrannical, and unjust power towards itself, then I would say that this could only occur if the proletariat hadn't really taken power, but that a class outside the proletariat, a group of people inside the proletariat, a bureaucracy or petite bourgeois elements had taken power. I'm not at all satisfied with that theory of revolution for a lot of reasons, historical and other. But even if one were to accept it for the sake of argument, still that theory is holding that, is maintaining that it is proper for the proletariat to take power and exercise it in a violent and bloody and unjust fashion because it is claimed, in my opinion, falsely, that will be, that will lead to a more just society in which the state will wither away, in which the proletariat will be a universal class and so on and so forth. If it weren't for that further justification, the concept of a dictatorship of the proletariat, violent and bloody, would certainly be unjust. Now that, to me, like the whole debate leads to that moment where Foucault just totally openly admits that he can't see any objection to the proletariat doing violent, bloody revolution over the entire class of bourgeoisie. Him saying, I can't see an objection to the proletariat using bloody and unjust violence. Uh, you can't see an objection to being unjust. Like, I, I think he would then go and say, like, well, what is unjust? He's already projected the notion of the justness of a revolution having anything to do with it. Because it's not because of justice that you do something. It's because of power, the will to power, the attainment of power.
I try to put my Foucault lens on as I listen to Chomsky and Chomsky says, ideal society, better society. And like each one of those words just bounce off of Foucault's bald little head, you know, like better <laughs> ideal. Like, what are you talking about? And just what does that even mean? And mm -hmm. he doesn't go into that with Chomsky, but just, just tries to shoot right to the point. And we're grateful for it because it exposes that. So we talked about the length of the hair of the hippies and that's minor. Then we talk about this bloody revolution stuff and that is where this moral and cultural relativism really exposes its extreme on the violent bloody end in terms of what it is willing to, you know, tolerate in pursuit of its aims. But then there's stuff that's maybe in between those two extremes that we would still see as a great cause for alarm. And that is that if you are willing to allow this ideology reformulate what you are willing to tolerate in terms of bloody violent revolution, wiping out an entire class, then what else are you willing to tolerate or justify? What other norms of society do you feel that it's important to subvert? And this is where several of these figures, Foucault, Derrida, Barthes, have a name for themselves. There's a blot on their name that frequently gets brought up. And that is the idea that there was a moment in the 1970s where the question of changing or abolishing the legal restrictions on child adult sex was raised in France. And a petition was released signed by a number of academics and philosophers, among which were these individuals, uh, arguing for the abolishment of the legal restriction on adult child sex. And it's interesting to look at their arguments. So let me just pull that up here because I, I searched around online everywhere. I could not actually, I found the text of the petition in French, but I couldn't find the English translation anywhere. And so I went ahead and had somebody who knows French translate it for us. So I'm going to pull that up here. So Let's just go through and see if we can find the right parts of it. Open letter to the Commission of Revision of the Penal Code for the revision of some legislative texts governing the relationship between adults and minors. It first acknowledges that there are important restrictions by law, including the concept of misappropriation for minors and the prohibition of sexual relations with minors under 15 years of age and, and homosexual relations defined as indecent or moral acts. The evolution of morals in a youth that feels the excesses of meticulous segregation as oppressive make these legal texts only the instruments of a coercion instead of guaranteeing a right. So do we see the concept of the power principle and blurring of the boundaries and moral and cultural relativism in this statement. I'd say that it's there. If you take away modesty and nature as rationale, and, and there, this is at the intersection of the decriminalization of homosexuality. And so you're going to find that a lot of the arguments used to argue against the criminalization of homosexuality get repurposed also to be against the criminalization of adult child sex. And this is a different thing from people will frequently say the, the gays are trying to normalize pedophilia. And that's a common trope that gets tossed out there. And it may be because of these arguments appearing in the same legal debates that that happened. There, there are other reasons that people have on it, but you can argue against the normalization of adult child sex without arguing against gay marriage or the decriminalization of homosexuality. They're not tied together. Okay, and then they bring up a recent case of a person okay so they get they quickly get to the question of consent which becomes important because the idea that adults engaging in consensual sexual acts should not be criminalized was one of the foundational arguments of decriminalizing homosexuality and so the question then of what is consent, at what age can somebody consent, was the crux of the matter, because that notion of consent was still important to the legal institutions at the time in France. And so the problem of knowing what age a child can freely give their consent to a sexual relationship was introduced, and they defined it as a social problem and that it was up to the commission to provide the appropriate answer to our time. And so they are providing the commission with an argument that they'll make over the next few um, paragraphs. 
So the signatories of this letter consider that the complete freedom of partners in sexual relationship is necessary in physician for the legality of that relationship. So what they're saying is as long as everybody consents, then no aspect of that relationship should be criminalized. <clears throat> they reference the penal code promulgated by Napoleon, did not see any repression for sexual acts not accompanied by violence, whatever the age of the participants. It only envisaged the case of rape or indecent assault committed with violence. And this is something that comes up, we'll see later, in the modern arguments of, the, of that is that if there's no violence or coercion involved, then a child can actually consent. So that speaks really to the notion of informed consent and looking at these questions with more of a view than whether or not violence or coercion could take place. And if you want to see how this can be expressed in a way that's maybe a little bit more obvious, just look at any of the religious cults which normalize adult child sexual relationships. There's no violence or coercion that is overt in those cases. Some of them have elevated the act of an adult and a child engaging in sex to some sort of religious right. And they even get the parents to go along with it and encourage it. But that's because they're all under ideology of religion. But that should at least let you know that there is an element of ideology and indoctrination that can mess with the concept of consent. And there was a law of 1832, which created the offense of indecent assault committed without violence on a child of less than 11 years old. And that is what is on the books there. And then in 1863, it was raised to 13 years old. And then in 1945, raised to 15 years old. So these are this is the age of consent, essentially, starting at 11 in 1832 and gradually increasing in time. Uh that's a very Foucauldian paragraph. I bet you he even wrote it. If you're taking the group, like, at this time, it was like this. At this time, it was like this. At this time, it was like this. Okay. To say. Uh, who's to say? So this criminal qualification leads today to aberrant results. If we stick to the letter of the law, whether an adult or a minor will have practiced or attempted to practice any sexual relationships with a minor under 15 years of age commits a crime and they get a sentence of five to 10 years of criminal punishment. Text inapplicable and unimplemented in most cases, because if we are, if it were every day, hundreds of boys appearing in the courts for having fun with a 14 year old girlfriend on some beach or some seller of the HLM, the legislator himself would be accused of complicity with the crime since he has authorized the sale of contraceptives to girls under 15 years old, which implies sexual intercourse, therefore the crime on the part of the partner. So they're pointing out a contradiction between the government distributing contraceptives to children and the law. And somebody say that's a legitimate argument, that they that might need to affect a change one way or the other. Well, there's What's like that? little nuggets of truth in all this stuff that I think yeah. is what they said. I was like listening to Thaddeus Russell talk about it. He talks all the time about there are unjust cases where a 19-year-old boy can go to jail for having sex with his... 17 year old girlfriend or whatever mm -hmm. and that, that sucks it's obviously but then they they take that thing that is yeah that's kind of messed up and then they just run with it yep and then, well they use it to say that we should get rid of all the boundaries rather than to say there's an accommodation that could be made in the form of romeo and juliet laws or whatever it is that accounts for that so they say so we have to basically decriminalize it or take into account the consent of the minor so with regard to the adolescent between 15 and 17 years of age, the law already recognizes their capacity and freedom to engage in sexual relations, but with the discriminatory condition that these relations are heterosexual. Their partner does not commit any offense in having sexual relations with them as long as he or she is of a different sex and does not incite them to escape the authority of parents or guardians. However, if the partner is of the same sex, it is punishable by six months to three years and a fine. From 1790 to 1942, there were no laws at all on the books regarding homosexuality. And then it was in 1942 where the first laws involved uh, a minor of the same sex. And then in 1945, the text is still ap effective and applied on a daily basis, and people are regularly arrested and, and prosecuted. Whereas 
in most Western countries since the end of the Second War, the evolution of morals and ideas has led it to remove criminalization of homosexual conduct from the codes. The signatories of this letter denounce the inequity and discriminatory nature of articles described above. They believe that the text must be repealed. And as the text repressing adultery, the interruption of pregnancy. So they're mentioning other sexual type laws that have been repealed and provisions claiming to protect children and youth, such as inciting of minors to lewdness, which can allow to indict any person promoting or facilitating sexual relations between minors. The misappropriation of minors are incompatible with the evolution of our society, justifying harassment and pure police controls and must be repealed, profoundly modified, and in this sense, a recognition of the right of the child and the adolescent to maintain relations with the persons of his choice. So it's interesting that in removing the safeguards that society has put on place over the exploitation and abuse of children, what they're essentially saying is we need to allow the child to choose. And these laws are restricting the freedom of children to choose to have sex with adults, which is unironically probably the justification that you'll frequently see with people who do have pedophilia when they are caught and investigated. They'll frequently say it was the child that seduced me. And I've, I went through medical school and in the time that we learn about different psychopathologies and they cover sexual issues and they'll show you a video of people who are caught abusing children being interrogated and, and what they say. And that's a common explanation that's there. There's a lot of the people who will justify this and argue against it. There's something similar out of California a few years back, but they'll say that there's some unjust rule in there that there's a fine there for homosexuals, but not for straight people. We want to just mm -hmm. lift it also for the homosexuals instead of also place it there for heterosexuals. And you can totally understand the concept of this should not be disparate between a heterosexual or homosexual, but the, your answer is to abolish all the rules or update them so that the consent of the child can be part of the law. But it seems to me like the, the better answer to that sort of thing would be upholding these situations that, that say maybe certain ages are too early for consent for the children, but it should definitely be universal, no matter if it's heterosexual or homosexual. So then there's a, a list of signatures on it. And I haven't finished this yet, but it's worth looking where you just look at who are the people that signed their names to this. So you have the general secretary of one of the universities, a Frank Smarch philosopher, communist, he ultimately killed his wife and was a schizophrenic. Dennis he, Altman. He was, he was Foucault's advisor, Althusser. Oh, okay. Let's see. Dennis Altman, academic, a gay rights activist. Jean-Paul, a French writer, associate of Foucault, one of the first public figures to die of AIDS openly, giving the disease a human face and challenging public perception. Claude Bardot, mathematician, Roland Barthes, essayist, philosopher, French literary theorist, Marxist, some activists, even some conservatives, Simone de Bouvier, a Marxist, intellectual, existentialist philosopher. She herself is acknowledged to have seduced and groomed underage children. And you could have a whole video on what we know about some of these people who have made this argument. Including Foucault Where do we himself in his private life. Yeah. Did I even get to Foucault on all of this? It's just, it's so interesting how many philosophers there's, there's, show up on this list. So you've got Deleuze, Derrida, Michel, there he is right there. And you would say maybe it, they were just really getting lost in the weeds of this legal document. It really wasn't, it wasn't all that. Well, shortly after this, he gave an interview on a radio channel, which you can find a transcription of, but it's really hard to locate it. Okay, so you can find the transcript for this interview in a book published, which is a collection of interviews and other writings by Michel Foucault. And it has a chapter, which is a transcript of this radio dialogue from April 4th, 1978. This is shortly after the petition for the abolition of age of consent laws was released. And in it, Michel Foucault, Guy Hockingham, and Jean Denet, who are all signatories and the people who created and put forth the petition, explain a little bit of their thinking behind the petition. 
Now, there's a couple of themes that are woven throughout this discussion that I just want to present up front so that you can pick them out when we go through it. Number one, this whole discussion is essentially a deconstruction of consent. And it deconstructs the notion of consent by, first of all, trying to expand consent to allow children to consent to sexual relationships with adults and frame the prohibition of societal respect of child consent in such matters as a form of oppression or repression. In doing this, it tries to remove adult child sex acts from the discussion of rape because rape being conceived of as dealing with not just violence but also consent has some overlap with adult child sex. In the weirdest twist at the very end, after making all of these arguments about respecting children's consent, they finally say, actually, consent doesn't matter because consent is an issue having to deal with legal contracts and nobody signs a contract before engaging in sex. That's, that's one of the central themes of this interview. The other theme is framing societal restrictions and prohibitions against adult child sexual interactions as a form of oppression and repression. And it does a form of victim offender reversal by saying that it's actually the children who are the victims of society because the children no longer have adult sexual relationships open to them and that the adults involved are themselves victims because they are depicted as monsters or as perverts simply because society has set up these laws. And this reflects Foucault's idea that it is the establishment of laws and boundaries in a society which create monsters rather than those laws arising to protect vulnerable populations from people who would do things outside the moral standards of society. You'll find a demonization of the medical and legal systems as the perpetrators of repression in the narrative that they're weaving here. And if you pay attention, you will find that there's a bit of projection on their part where they repeatedly describe children as desiring and seducing adults and that the system of laws is infringing upon those children's right to pursue their desires. Furthermore, they frame adult child sexual interactions in normalized terms, calling such instances of sexual abuse, making love or engaging in pleasure. So with that introduction, let's go ahead and uh, start. Michel Foucault is, of course, the postmodern philosopher who is at the heart of a lot of this. Guy Hockingham is another gay rights activist and queer theorist, and Jean Denet is a French actor, and all three of them were involved in this petition. Foucault begins laying the groundwork for why the petition was created in the first place. Things had evolved on such a wide front, in such an overwhelming and at first sight apparently irreversible way, that many of us began to hope that the legal regime imposed on the sexual practices of our contemporaries would at last be relaxed and broken up. So there's a couple of things here. He's framing the legal protections of minors from sexual abuse and exploitation as a legal regime. And you will recognize that phrase regime from Foucault's concept of epistemic regimes. And this just reinforces his notion that the systems in place in a particular society are a way of controlling and maintaining power. And they oppress and repress the people who are not in power by setting up laws that turn them into criminals or declare them to be mad. So that framing is already here at the beginning. But the other thing is you can see what's happening is a piggybacking of issues. This is at a time when society is coming to terms with the reality of homosexuality and decriminalizing that practice. And he's piggybacking on that issue to say, as long as we're rearranging the sexual norms of our society, we should also get rid of the age of consent laws. This is an issue that plagued a lot of the gay rights activism early on, is that there was always a faction of people who were trying to include adult child sex normalization on the coattails of decriminalizing homosexuality. So as we continue, uh, Guy Hockingham says, Six months ago, we launched a petition demanding the abrogation of a number of articles in the law, in particular those concerning relations between adults and minors, those forbidding the incitement of minors to debauchery, and the decriminalization of relations between minors and adults below the age of 15. 
So right off the bat, they're taking ownership over this petition. They're the ones that conceived it, created it, and put it out there. And they're targeting specifically, they want to normalize and make legal sexual relations between adults and children below the age of 15. By carving out these particular targets, that's what they are saying. So keep that in mind as we go through the conversation. Guy continues, but furthermore, at the level of public opinion, at the level of the mass media, the newspapers, radio, television, etc., it's rather the opposite that is beginning to take place, with new arguments being used. These new arguments are essentially about childhood, that is to say about the exploitation of popular sentiment and its spontaneous horror of anything that links sex with a child. You have to keep in mind what they're trying to do is normalize viewing children as essentially sexual beings and therefore allowing them to engage in sex with adults. They are describing what is taking place, which is a pushback against their petition, where people abhorrent to what they're arguing for are reinforcing the call to see children as a vulnerable population who themselves become targets and victims of manipulation and abuse by grooming sexual predators. Here, they are blaming the media for blowing this issue up into being more than it should be in their mind by saying society has this horror of anything that links sex with a child. Now, most people would look at this issue and say, actually, the horror that society feels is a reflection of the reality that society acknowledges children are a vulnerable population who have neither the maturity or capacity to understand the issues around sexuality and don't have the maturity to understand the nature of psychological manipulation that goes on in such arrangements. Guy goes on to say, when somebody says that child pornography is the most terrible of present-day scandals, one cannot but be struck by the disproportion between this, child pornography, which is not even prostitution, and everything that is happening in the world today. What the blacks have to put up with in the United States, for instance. This whole campaign about pornography and prostitution, about all those social phenomena, which are in any case controversial, nobody here is advocating child pornography or prostitution, only leads to one fundamental question. It's worse when children are consenting, and worse still if it's neither pornographic nor paid for. In other words, the entire criminalizing context serves only to bring out the kernel of the accusation. You want to make love with consenting children. It serves only to stress the traditional prohibition and to stress in new ways with new arguments the traditional prohibition on sexual relations without violence, without money, without any form of prostitution that may take place between majors and minors. So this is a form of whataboutism where they're pointing to what they describe as even worse abuses and saying that we're not, there's no camera involved, there's no exchange of money, these are just children who want to engage in sexual relations with adults, and it's not as bad as all this other stuff. So the fact that people are up in arms around it is just a reflection of the traditional norms of society repressing us. And if you start with that cultural and moral relativism that Foucault espouses, where there's no absolute truth, all boundaries, all societal norms are social constructs, and so there's no absolute justification of one or the other, then you could see society's prohibition on adult child sex as an arbitrary social construct that we just need to transgress in order to normalize. And that is the position that people who adopt this philosophy take as reflected in the arguments that they're making here. This notion of criminalizing, where you're creating a class of people who are victims of society by making their drives, impulses, and actions criminal acts, reframes the reality to place them as victims of society rather than understanding that society is creating safeguards and boundaries to protect vulnerable populations, and they, in committing acts which transgress those boundaries, define themselves as criminals. So then Jean Denet interjects, we already know that some psychiatrists consider that sexual relations between children and adults are always traumatizing, and that if a child doesn't remember them, it is because they remain in his unconscious. But in any case, the child is marked forever. The child will become emotionally disturbed. So what takes place with the intervention of psychiatrists in court is a manipulation of the children's consent, a manipulation of their words. So he's putting us in a scenario where an adult and a child are caught engaged in a sexual relationship. It's brought to court and then the child comes out and says, I am in love with this adult. I consented to these sexual relations. And he's pointing out that psychiatrists and really society at large has determined that children are not able by definition to consent to sexual relations with adults because they are 
incapable of understanding the issues, they are a vulnerable population which may be manipulated and groomed, and that the predators who target these vulnerable children do so in a way that may not show any evidence of violence or direct threats because of the nature of psychological grooming. And so society and the legal system and the mental health system has established that these boundaries need to be set to protect the vulnerable population. They're framing those societal boundaries as a form of victimization, in this case, of the child, because the court and the psychologist will not accept the child's statement that they consented to the relationship because they assume from the beginning that such consent is not possible. And again, you have to understand that consent is not simply the statement of yes. It also includes the notion of informed consent, where somebody has to be mentally capable and competent to understand the issues and ramifications of what is being consented to. And children are incapable of meeting that criteria of informed consent. Okay, so we continue. So now we're going to get to Foucault's statement here. And this is one of the key passages in this argument. What is emerging, and indeed why I believe it was important to speak about the problem of children, what is emerging is a new penal system, a new legislative system, whose function is not so much to punish offenses against these general laws concerning decency as to protect populations and parts of populations regarded as particularly vulnerable. In other words, the legislator will not justify the measures he is proposing by saying the universal decency of mankind must be defended. What he will say is there are people for whom others' sexuality may become a permanent danger. In this category, of course, children, who may find themselves at the mercy of an adult sexuality that is alien to them and may well be harmful to them. Hence, there is a legislation that appeals to this notion of a vulnerable population, a high-risk population, as they say, and to a whole body of psychiatric and psychological knowledge imbibed from psychoanalysis. It doesn't really matter whether the psychoanalysis is good or bad. And this will give the psychiatrist the right to intervene twice. Firstly, in general terms, to say, yes, of course, children do have sexuality. We can't go back to those old notions about children being pure and not knowing what sexuality is. But we psychologists or psychoanalysts or psychiatrists or teachers, we know perfectly well that children's sexuality is a specific sexuality with its own forms, its own periods of maturation, its own high points, its specific drives, its own latency periods too. This sexuality of the child is territory with its own geography that the adult must not enter. It is virgin territory, sexual territory of course, but territory that must preserve its virginity. The adult will therefore intervene as guarantor of that specificity of child sexuality in order to protect it. And on the other hand, in each particular case, he will say, this is an instance of an adult bringing his own sexuality into the child's sexuality. It could be that the child, even with his own sexuality, may have desired that adult. He may even have consented. He may even have made the first moves. We may even agree that it was he who seduced the adult. But we specialists with our psychological knowledge know perfectly well that even the seducing child runs a risk, in every case, of being damaged and traumatized by the fact that he or she has had a sexual dealings with an adult. Consequently, the child must be protected from his own desires, even when his desires orientate him towards an adult. The psychiatrist is the one who will be able to say, I can predict the trauma of this degree of importance will occur as a result of this or that type of sexual relation. It is therefore within the legislative framework basically intended to protect certain vulnerable sections of the population with the establishment of a new medical power, that a conception of sexuality and above all the relations between child and adult sexuality will be based and it is one that is extremely questionable. So here he's trying to put up what he thinks is a straw man argument, the idea that psychiatrists acknowledge that there is a budding form of sexuality within children, but that it is vulnerable to exploitation and abuse by adults. And so the role of society and the legal system is to draw a hard boundary between adult and child sexuality. And even if the child, through their own admission, states that they were consenting to the relationship, or even if it seems it's more than consent that the child themselves seduced the adult, that the legal system, the medical system, and society at large should still not respect that relationship. The thing is, he's arguing exactly the case. That's exactly the nature of the role of the legal and medical system, is to safeguard this vulnerable population. But he's calling this entire justification for the laws extremely questionable. And this falls into Foucault's theme that 
all of these powers, the legal and medical authorities, they've gotten things wrong in the past. All of the things that they've ever set up as boundaries, rules, or norms are social constructs and arbitrary meant to only preserve the interests of the powerful. And so they are a form of repression on people who just want to be able to act out their desires. That is the thread running through this entire argument. Note that he's willing to actually say that some things are wrong, some things are questionable, but the things that he says are questionable are not the intermixing of adult and child sexuality, but the rationalizations that would safeguard against abuse and exploitation of children. That's the thing he says is questionable. So Guy Hockenham goes on to say, but the overall tendency of today is indisputably not only to fabricate a type of crime that is quite simply the erotic or sensual relationship between a child and an adult, but also, since this may be isolated in the form of a crime, to create a certain category of the population defined by the fact that it tends to indulge in those pleasures. There then exists a particular category of the pervert, in the strict sense of monsters whose aim in life is to practice sex with children. Indeed, they become perverts and intolerable monsters since the crime as such is recognized and constituted, and now strengthened by the whole psychoanalytical and sociological arsenal. What we are doing is constructing an entirely new type of criminal, a criminal so inconceivably horrible that his crime goes beyond any explanation, any victim. It is rather like that kind of legal monster, the term an attack without violence that is unprovable in any case and leaves no trace, since even the anoscope is unable to find the slightest lesion that might legitimate in some way or other the notion of violence. You've got a little bit of the projection and revealing nature of uh, their argument. He's talking about the sexual relationship between a child and adult and describing that as them indulging in those pleasures rather than acknowledging that this would be an adult exploiting and sexually abusing a child. The second thread in this particular part is this reversal of victim and offender, saying that the adults who pursue and engage in these relationships are victims of the system which defines them as criminal by establishing laws which they see as arbitrary and oppressive rather than protective. They say that the criminal or the monster is created by the establishment of the laws rather than that those acts define people as predators and that the laws are designed to protect vulnerable children from such predators. The third thread in this is, again, reinforcing the notion that they are claiming that since the children are willing and appear to consent and that they did not have to forcibly commit violence on them, then society should allow such relationships and not characterize it as a form of abuse or exploitation. And he mentions the anoscope, which would be a way that doctors in the legal system would establish that sodomy or other forms of violence had been engaged. They're trying to make the case that if violence isn't involved, then society should have no problem with it. And again, this is specifically and intentionally trying to insert the notion of legitimate consent into how society receives the statement of children who may have been groomed and manipulated into relationships with adults. Okay, so after laying out their base argument, there's more of a freeform discussion that takes place where they respond to issues and questions. And uh, one of the first ones is that the interviewer says that it seems interesting that certain other progressive groups are not excited about getting involved with this petition, particularly women's group who have been focused on the issue of rape and making sure that it is uh, defended and prosecuted in court. Guy Hockingham says, We were very careful in the text of the open letter to the penal code. We took great care to speak exclusively of an indecent act not involving violence and incitement of a minor to commit an indecent act. We were extremely careful not to touch in any way the problem of rape, which is totally different. Now you have to understand what they're doing here is they are carving out by allowing the notion that children can consent to sexual relationships with an adult then they are assuming that if such a relationship is found and the child claims to be consenting, then that is not a form of rape. That is not a form of sexual violence because children can consent. And again, it's that foundational issue which they're trying to undo in this whole thing because the legal system, the medical system, and society at large would say, no, children are unable by definition to consent to such relationships, and they're trying to hammer this home that they can. 
They don't want it to be seen as a form of rape or sexual violence because that would clearly put them on the wrong side of the issue and society would not accept it. So by playing the game with the notion of rape, they are carving out an exception to allow them to normalize the sexual relations between adults and children. So then Mr. Dene chimes in, when we say that the problem of consent is quite central in matters concerned with pedophilia, we are not, of course, saying that consent is always there, but, and this is where one may separate the attitude of the law with regard to rape and with regard to pedophilia. With regard to rape, judges consider that there is a presumption of consent on the part of the women and that the opposite has to be demonstrated. Whereas where pedophilia is concerned, it is the opposite. It's considered that there is a presumption of non-consent, a presumption of violence. Even in a case where no charge of an indecent act with violence has been made, that is, in a case in which the charge used is that of an indecent act without violence, with consenting pleasure. Because it has to be said that an indecent act without violence is the repressive legal translation of consenting pleasure. We must certainly see how the system of proof is manipulated in opposite ways in the case of rape and women, and in the case of indecent assault on a minor. So here... What he's saying is that there's an injustice in the form of the way consent is treated in cases of adult women coming forth with rape and children and adults discovered to be engaged in sexual relationships. But this makes complete sense because women are capable of consenting. And so one of the questions before the court is the nature and presence of that consent in a sexual relationship. In the case of children, the acknowledgement that, by definition, children cannot consent to sexual relationships with an adult removes the question of whether or not consent takes place. It doesn't matter whether the child says they were consenting to the relationship because a child is not capable of rendering informed consent to such things, and they are vulnerable to psychological manipulation and grooming by an adult. And you can see here that they're making the case that an indecent act without violence is just another word for consenting pleasure. When they say consenting pleasure, that means that both the adult and child are agreeing to be a part of a sexual relationship. And the injustice from their perspective is that the law considers this still a form of abuse. So then the question comes up, well, at what age can you actually consider the question of consent? Foucault responds, yes, it's difficult to lay down barriers. Consent is one thing. It's quite a different thing when we are dealing with the likelihood of a child being believed when speaking of his sexual relations, his affections, his tender feelings, or his contacts. The sexual adjective is often an embarrassment here because it does not correspond to reality. A child's ability to explain what his feelings are, what actually happened, how far he is believed, these are quite different things. Now, where children are concerned, they are supposed to have a sexuality that can never be directed towards an adult, and that's that. Secondly, it is supposed that they are not capable of talking about themselves, of being sufficiently lucid about themselves. They are unable to express their feelings, therefore they are not believed. They are thought to be incapable of sexuality, and they are not thought to be capable of speaking about it. But, after all, listening to a child, hearing him speak, Hearing him explain what his relations actually are with someone, adult or not, provided one listens with enough sympathy, must allow one to establish more or less what degree of violence, if any, was used or what degree of consent was given. And to suppose that a child is incapable of explaining what happened and incapable of giving his consent are two abuses that are intolerable, quite unacceptable. So here you can see the things that Foucault is actually able to label as intolerable and unacceptable are not the manipulation and psychological coercion of a child into a sexual relationship with an adult, but rather the fact that society understands that children can be manipulated and are vulnerable to manipulation and exploitation by adults. And so the question of whether or not they say they agreed to it does not matter to the court because adults who prey upon children manipulate children into this. And their position, the ones who get caught in these manipulation, is always the child seduced me or the child was willing. But that's because they are justifying their abuse and their exploitation by claiming that the child themselves was complicit in it. And in doing so, they're framing society and the legal and medical system as the bad guys and themselves as the victims. And the thing is, it reveals in these arguments by Foucault that he understands that society knows that children cannot consent to these things. He just believes that society is wrong. Children can consent to them.
So Foucault is then posed with a question. If you were a legislator, would you fix no limit? Would you leave it to the judges to decide whether or not an indecent act was committed with or without consent? Is that your position? And Foucault says, in any case, an age barrier laid down by law does not have much sense. Again, the child may be trusted to say whether or not he was subjected to violence. An examining magistrate, a liberal, told me once when we were discussing this question, after all, there are 18-year-old girls who are practically forced to make love with their fathers or their stepfathers. They may be 18, but it's an intolerable system of constraint, and one, moreover, that they may feel as intolerable if only people are willing to listen to them and put them in conditions in which they can say what they feel. So here Foucault is conflating a couple of things. He's saying that because there are 18-year-olds who themselves are abused by their fathers or stepfathers, then the notion that we have to have a particular line between an adult and a child is itself a problem. He's conflating two different things. First of all, he's calling a situation of domestic sexual abuse and rape of an 18-year-old by a father or stepfather as making love. So you can see that there's a diminishment of the reality of rape and sexual abuse. But he's using the fact that the victims in this case are over the age of 18 to argue that this could also be a form of child sexual abuse, but they're above 18, so it's not. And it's almost like, aha, that, well, we got you. There's no reason to have any particular age. But this is a ridiculous argument. The issue of even an 18-year-old being raped by a father or stepfather is a case of domestic sexual abuse. It could be a wife who was raped by their husband. The issue with rape is whether or not there is informed consent involved in the sexual relation. There should be laws which would convict a father or stepfather who raped an 18-year-old girl, just as there are laws which would convict an adult who engages in adult-child sexual relation. The fact that these are two separate and distinct laws that may overlap in some instances does not nullify the necessity or the reality of both of them. And now we get to the final deconstruction of this whole question. Uh, Guy continues, As far as this question of consent is concerned, I prefer the terms used by Michel Foucault. Listen to what the child says and give it certain credence. This notion of consent is a trap in any case. What is sure is that the legal form of an intersex consent is nonsense. No one signs a contract before making love. Foucault chimes in, consent is a contractual notion, and Guy continues, it's a purely contractual notion. When we say that children are quote-unquote consenting in these cases, all we intend to say is this, in any case, there was no violence or organized manipulation in order to gain effective or erotic relations. So now the great deconstruction here is that we've argued this whole time about consent, but in the end, consent doesn't really matter. Consent is only, it's a legal term that has to do with contracts and nobody signs a contract. So really, it's just the only issue that matters is not really consent. It's just was any violence or coercion involved in establishing the relationship. And so in their mind, as long as they avoid any signs of outward violence or can defend themselves against manipulation by saying, oh, the child seduced me, then it's okay. And that's the whole basis of this argument. And the thing is, you'll discover that these rationalizations have persisted and you will find them in the literature and in the arguments of people trying to normalize adult child sex into the modern age. They close out their arguments. The public affirmation of consent to such acts is extremely difficult, as we know. Everybody, judges, doctors, the defendant, everybody knows that the child was consenting, but nobody says anything because, apart from anything else, there's no way it can be introduced. So he's saying even in the setting of court where a child claims to be consenting, claims to be the one who initiated the relationship, all the judges, doctors, and the defendant know that the child was consenting, and here they are projecting. They're projecting their own perspective into the minds of everybody that would be involved. In reality, all the judges, doctors, and everybody in the courtroom but the defendant would understand that this child had been groomed and manipulated into an abusive and exploitative sexual relationship with a predator, not that the child could consent. But in their mind, they want to see that society is simply preventing all of these people in the courtroom from acknowledging that the child consented because of those darned social norms. And the final word is, to express this in terms of legal consent is an absurdity. In any case, if one listens to what a child says, and if he says, I didn't mind, 
That doesn't have the legal value of consent, but I'm also very mistrustful of that formal recognition of consent on the part of a minor because I know it will never be obtained and is meaningless in any case. So I, I see this last phrase as an acknowledgement that the court is not going to buy any kid who claims that they were actually a consenting party to a sexual relationship with an adult. They know that no court is going to accept that. And so they want the whole justification to be as long as there was no sign of violence or no manipulation or coercion. It's just that we have learned so much about how sexual predators groom the children that they target, groom the environment so that they have sexual access to the children that they exploit. And this type of manipulation absolutely can disrupt the sense of agency and identity that a child has so that they can be what people would see as brainwashed into an exploitative relationship with an adult. And that will carry through even into a legal system where they will continue to claim that they are in love with or have consented to the adult who preyed upon them. Pay attention to the arguments that are used here because you will see them pop up again in modern discourse. The transcript for this interview was reprinted in an underground journal called Semiotext in a special issue titled Loving Boys. And that issue was then reprinted and regularly distributed by the North American Man-Boy Love Association, which was an organization advocating for the elimination of age of consent laws and normalization of what they called intergenerational sex. If you look at the FBI files for this organization, which have been disclosed and are available on archive.org, you can find the same arguments being part of their literature. And even as recently as this past month, these arguments have shown up again in people who have been educating college students in American college campuses. I was still the adult <laughs> child sex. That's always a big seller. Oh yeah. Well, that, I, I, had, um, I had good friends who said, are you crazy? Do not write that book. Man, listen, you're talking to a guy who for 25 years has been making arguments more or less in defense of adult child sex in classrooms. Uh, and I don't, know if the, I don't know if it's the same argument as yours, but I even authored a piece in the Daily Beast in which I called into question the age of consent laws, oh, um, which is, yeah. you know, and I, I brought to bear the arguments I was making in class. Imagine that an adult male uh, wants to have sex with a 12-year-old girl. Imagine that she's a willing participant. A, a very standard, very widely held view that there's something deeply wrong about this, and it's wrong independent of it being criminalized. It's not obvious to me that it is in fact wrong. I think this is a mistake. And I think that exploring why it's a mistake will tell us not only things about adult child sex and statutory rape, but also about fundamental principles of morality. There's actually some meta studies which seem to suggest that in some cases, uh, at least with regard to um, adult males and um, underage uh, males, that it's not harmful or, mm -hmm. If it is harmful, we can't decide whether the harm is due to the sex itself or the fact that society goes berserk over it. And so one of the articles I was reading said, look, this is wrong. We don't need to know whether it's harmful. The empirical question of whether or not there's any long-term harm we could track on this is really beside the point. And I was kind of struck with a question. I thought, well, it's not obvious to me why that is. Well, there's a couple of things to say here. One is, even if you are looking for a threshold, let's say there's a threshold, I'm, I'm making this number up, but let's say it's at age eight. Um, still, that tells you that some adult child sex is permissible. Second, the notion that it's wrong even with a one-year-old is, is not quite obvious to me. There are reports in some cultures of grandmothers filleting their, uh, the baby boys to calm them down when, when a colicky. Now, I don't know if this is true, but this, this is sort of widely reported as occurring in, in, in at least one culture. And it, it working, that the grandmothers believe, believe this actually works. If this were to be true, and again, I don't know it to be true. If it were to be true, it's hard to see what would be wrong with it. So, yeah, I, I guess I think, no, I, I don't think there's a blanket period beyond which this is permissible. If we're interested in willing participation, which is the way I structured it, then yeah, there's a, there's a point below which people aren't willing participants in anything because they don't have intentions or they don't have the sort of mental states that allow for willing participation. But no, I, I, don't, I don't think it's blanket wrong at any age. Okay, on the subject of how Foucault treats the issue of sexual violence towards children, 
There's another very telling excerpt from a different interview, one where they were talking about confinement, psychiatry, and prison, and the issue of rape and sexual laws came up and it intersected with children. If you go to the relevant uh, paragraph, Foucault, in talking with some women in the context of this interview, yet both of you as women were immediately upset at the idea that one should say rape belongs to the realm of physical violence and must simply be treated as such. Because the women were trying to make the case that rape is something more than just physical violence. And from their perspective, it would define the act of rape, a sexual assault defined by there being no consent involved. So even if there isn't an act of physical violence, even there's no bruising, no bleeding, if the victim did not consent, then it is by definition rape. And the person he's talking with says, especially when children, little girls are involved, and then Another party to the conversation says, well, in the case of Roman Polanski in the USA, where there was a question of oral, anal, and vaginal sex with a 13-year-old girl, the girl did not seem to have undergone a trauma. She rang up a friend of hers to talk about it all, but her sister was listening behind the door, and so the whole business of the Polanski trial was set in motion. There was no wound there. The, quote, trauma came from a certain social ideal formations. The girl seems to have enjoyed her experiences, in Foucault responds. She seems to have been a consenting party. And that brings me to the second question I'd like to ask you. Rape can all the same be defined fairly easily, not only as non-consent, but as refusal of physical access. On the other hand, there is the problem for boys as well as girls, because legally rape of boys doesn't exist, of the child that is seduced. Or who begins to seduce you? Is it possible to propose a law that says one may have with a consenting child, a child who doesn't refuse, any kind of relations. This does not concern the law. The guy tries to change the conversation, but Foucault returns. This is a question that concerns children. There are children who throw themselves at an adult at the age of 10. So there are children who consent, who would be delighted, aren't there? And the woman he's talking with says, one shuts one's eyes to activities between children. When an adult is involved, there is no longer equality or a balance of discoveries and responsibilities. There's an inequality that is difficult to define. Foucault goes on, I'd be tempted to say from the moment the child doesn't refuse, there is no reason to punish any act. But one thing struck me yesterday when I was talking to members of the boards of magistrates. One of them was putting forward very radical points of view. He was the one, in fact, who was saying that rape didn't have to be punished as rape, that it was quite simply an act of violence. On the subject of children, he also began to take a very radical position, but at one point, he suddenly jumped and said, but I have to admit, if I saw someone touching my kids. So here you can see that Foucault's position on all of this is pretty much clear. That is, he believes that children can consent, that there are children out there who actively pursue adults, and that as a society, we are wrong to punish any adults who are party to those relationships. Pay attention. Samantha Geimer was just 13 when Roman Polanski offered to take these photos of her for a modeling shoot. About three weeks later, she says the then 43-year-old Polanski gave her alcohol and a quaalude before raping her. In a 2003 radio interview with Howard Stern, director Quentin Tarantino defended Polanski. I believe it's rape. I don't believe it's rape. I mean, not at 13. Not, not for these 13-year-old party girls. Tarantino repeatedly argues that the girl was complicit. More when you than have Europe, sex in China? with a 13-year-old girl and you're a grown man, uh -huh. you know that that's wrong because oh, no, she I'm has giving her booze and, and pills. I'm not, I'm not, look, she was down with it. All of these things are just ways to deconstruct the norms of society, which if you start from this point of moral and social constructivism where these things are arbitrary, nothing is objectively better or more just than anything else, then you can arrive at that point. And then you get the expression of, I think there's like a Nietzsche quote where a lot of philosophy is just people trying to provide rationalizations and justifications for their own base desires. And confess you hear. Yeah. When you hear later on what people who were associates of Foucault, who saw his actions said later that he was engaging in sexual abuse of minors. And some of that doesn't even line up with what he says there, because supposedly some of it was prostitution, which is one of the things he wasn't arguing for. Is he really going to try to say that was consenting and that the child was initiating that? Well, and that's the thing is, if you're going to justify this on its own, 
respecting the consent of the child, then you've already laid the groundwork for, well, then children prostitution should be legal anyway, because they should be allowed to consent to the financial arrangement if they can consent to the sexual arrangement. And so they, they just started with the end in mind. So there's no way to set up a barrier of any of these other things. They try to flip it around too, to make it seem like they're the ones looking out for the child's well-being. And you see that a lot now. You see that with, there was that Desmond is Amazing kid, the, the, the drag show kid who got up on stage dressed as like Gwen Stefani, showing off his midriff, doing all this stuff, and people were throwing dollar bills at him. And if you complain about that, I I was accused of sexualizing a child. They're like, why are you sexualizing him? This isn't sexual at all. What do you mean? No, it's clearly like he's on stage at, at a strip club and people are giving him dollar bills for dancing. Like, I'm not the one sexualizing this. It's clearly sexual. Yeah, there's the, also the way they fudge some ideas legally with ideas that are goofy. Like the way they say it's not equal that you treat it differently for homosexuals and straight people. Okay, sure. So abolish all the laws. It feels yeah. a little bit like the, the same sense that nowadays of the saying, we're going to put in these laws about conversion therapy. And everybody's in agreement that we think maybe there should be a law in place saying that, that of conversion therapy for adult homosexuals or, or even kid homosexuals, but then they tack into there that they are going to include transgenderism, that any sort of talking to a kid out of transgender ideas is also conversion therapy. And so they always tack in an idea of maybe something that's agreeable with something they're like, wait, what, what is it? You just took a big jump there. There's always some sort of sense that you can rescue some of it and some of the ideas are okay and good. Like you can use it to a bit, but the, the ultimate problem with them is how far they go. They go all the way down. And any sort of backing off of it is you're doing it wrong. And so sure, anybody could play with the ideas or get little concepts out of it that might be helpful or useful in our, or useful maybe even life of reevaluating what you think about something or reevaluating what do you think, what you thought are just some culturally constructed laws that maybe are ridiculous. But these guys go all the way and it all goes all the way. There's uh, James Lindsay, the author of the book, has said that everybody needs to think about what he calls their woke breaking point. And that is, if you agree with a lot of these social justice movements, if you get involved with them and you march in their circles, just take some time to think beforehand about what are the limits of your own personal perspective? How far is too far? Because when you find yourself in those crowds going too far, you need to have at least given it some thought ahead of the time because otherwise you get swept in with all of the group psychology that humans are all vulnerable to. And so that's pretty important. 